Oh, sure. And so, uh, yeah, so we have a really special treat tonight. Um, uh, the Short and Tragic Life of Robert Peace is really one of my favorite books. Um, it really, uh, it really moved me and made me think about life uh, from a very different angle than I had uh, before reading it. And uh, so I'm a huge fan of the author, uh, Jeff Hobbs, and he's uh, graciously agreed to come speak with us, which is so fucking cool. So uh, it's all you, man. Um, thank, thank you so much, Thomas. And um, yeah, I probably won't speak for like a full 30 minutes. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, and I thought I would just give a fairly brief primer on, uh, on this book, The Short and Tragic Life of Robert Peace. It, it's kind of a mouthful of a title, but uh, basically I lost one of my best friends um, now about 12 years ago. And then I, I did a really strange thing and wrote a book about his life that I didn't think anybody would read. Um, and I don't mean that as like false modesty or something. I really didn't. But um, um, anyway, I'll, I'll just speak a little bit about his life and, and how I came to do that. And, and a couple things that uh, I reflect on a lot regarding male friendship and um, and uh, and then I'm really eager to hear from you all and uh, again I'm just glad to be here with you all um, so Rob peace mm -hmm. uh, he was my roommate and one of my best friends for all four years of college um, we were paired up sort of randomly as freshman roommates and so mostly we just sat around a dorm room and talked about sports and girls and um, not about very much just because we're guys and that's how it was. Um, he helped me through like heartbreak a lot of the time because which was good because I um, wasn't very good with girls. Um, still I'm not even though I've been married to one for 18 years. Um, and he bailed me out of fist fights, which was also good because I didn't know how to be in those. Um, and after we graduated, uh, I mean, I still saw him now and again, but I, I got married pretty young and we moved to California and we were on different coasts. And um, so the last night I saw him was my wedding night. He was one of my groomsmen. And, and a few years after that, it, you know, we'd catch up just a few times a year on the phone. And um, again, not talking about that much, unfortunately, just like, how are you? I'm good, all good. Uh, and it seemed like there would, we were pretty young and life would be long and there would always be time for reunions. Um, and so we always left it like that, but uh, life isn't long for everybody. And uh, yeah, when we were 30 years old, Rob was shot and killed. Uh, this happened in like a basement with some marijuana he'd been selling um, pretty close to the house he grew up in in Newark, New Jersey. Um, so when I first met Rob, again, it was like the first day of freshman year um, at Yale. I assumed that all I know about him was that he played water polo and he hiked the Appalachian Trail with his friends in high school and he'd gone to like a parochial prep school. So I assumed that aside from being a black guy, he was a pretty typical Yale student, um, which he wasn't. Um, and not, not just because of where and how he grew up with his father in prison. Um, from the time he was seven years old, his father was convicted of a double homicide and uh, his mom um, worked very long hours for very little money, mostly in hospital kitchens and nursing homes. She still works in school cafeterias. Um, but uh, he, he was atypical also because he was a straight A student in molecular biophysics and biochemistry, which is about as easy as it sounds. And uh, he was captain of the water polo team for a couple of years. Um, and he was, uh, he had 
Um, these girls who would come by to braid his hair like anytime he needed. Um, and he was just a bright guy, kind of loved by all in college. Um, he also sold marijuana out of our dorm room, which seemed like a, not a very smart thing, but maybe um, something he knew how to do and maybe needed to do. Like maybe he was building a safety net or helping out his mom or saving up for grad school. Um, it seemed like nothing I should question. Um, and it seemed since we lived in a Yale dorm room and we're talking about marijuana, um, it seemed safe. Um, and in the meantime, at the time, I thought I was like, uh, uh, because I'd run, this sounds very silly, because I'd run track in high school, I thought I was like pretty cool with black people. Um, I was called like an honorary black man by my teammates. Um, so I thought, living with Rob that I was kind of down. Um, and he never let me know otherwise, I, I think more because he was amused than because he was polite. Um, so I thought I was pretty cool. Um, I also thought I was pretty observant. Like I'd always wanted to be a writer. I took writing classes there. I thought I paid attention to things and, and had an understanding. Um, and so, I mean, I was aware of, of things I've already mentioned. What I probably wasn't aware of, even in the context of our friendship and, and a lot of time that we spent together, um, what I was not aware of was the, uh, like how hard it was for him to reconcile this gift of a Yale education. It was actually a gift, like a rich white banker um, paid for his, most of his tuition, um, how to reconcile that with the uh, very real resentment of kind of blithely affluent dickish classmates, um, people like me, um, how to uh, manage guilt knowing like his mom was still at home in, in the old house that she cried every night for um, the first like six months he was away at college, um, guilt for his best high school friends from growing up who were also pretty bright guys but couldn't go to college because of financial or other personal reasons. Um, all, all of this friction that, um, like, it's easy to make him out to as this kind of Hamlet figure who trudged around campus scowling and with a chip on his shoulder, but Rob was not that person, he, he was uh, uh, just a bright light. He had a high-pitched laugh. He laughed all the time. He had this kind of stoner circle of like kind of hippie people and athletes and actors and international people who all just were drawn toward him and just like to be around him because he was a good person. And uh, all, all this friction he carried was very much invisible, um, at least to me. And uh, because I couldn't see it, it seemed like when he graduated from college that spring 2002, um, he was happy and it seemed like he was uh, um, kind of chosen to fulfill all these aspirations he had in science and taking care of his mom and, and traveling the world and, and uh, all these dreams he had for life. Uh, and he, he did accomplish some of those things over the next 10 years. But then again, he died uh, pointlessly and violently and very painfully in a, in a basement. Um, and uh, I remember I was like uh, brushing my teeth when my phone dinged and we had a one-year-old. I was trying not to wake her up um, when I got the news that this had happened. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, at the time, again, 30 years old, I, I'd never been to a, a funeral like that. I'd never um, really experienced close up losing someone before their time. Um, and so the, the funeral was a really powerful thing. Um, there were a few hundred people there, people from all over the world, from Yale, from Newark, um, 
the the sadness was intense, but the you know we, we did what you do when you are trying to celebrate someone. We just told stories started um, was from those stories. People formed that we all went home and, and we kept in touch and kept telling stories and um, <clears throat> we didn't want to let him go. And at some point I volunteered to uh, you know, make some kind of compilation that might be for like a high school newsletter or the college alumni magazine or just something for his family to have that spoke to his life and, uh, and not just his death. And, uh, and that's how I, I ended up sitting with his mom in, in her living room, like uh, six months after he died, um, talking uh, just making sure she was okay with this idea of uh, telling her son's story in, in some small way. Um, and I, I was pretty upfront about how unqualified I was. I'd never really written nonfiction or anything. Um, and I was, you know, a white guy um, looking the way I look, um, telling his story. Um, that was actually, she laughed at that moment. She said, like, I'm sitting right next to you. I can see that you're a white guy. Um, and I also told her I was worried about causing her more pain just by being there talking about her son, um, which of course I, I did. It was naive to even ask. But um, at the end of that afternoon, um, she said that would be nice for you to do something like that. Um, I think uh, she was just moved that people still cared. Um, and again, I didn't really know what I was doing or even why I was doing it. Um, I think it, that awareness came much later, but I originally, I was just going to go talk to like six or eight friends of his and family members, um, and maybe write, spend two weeks writing about a thousand or 2000 words, um, um, about the good memories, not just the bad ones. Um, and what I learned was that Rob Peace had a lot of friends, like a lot of friends. And everyone I talked to said, well, now you have to go talk to six other people. There was this girl he messed with once and there was this guy he worked with um, at the airport or a guy he taught with at the high school. Um, he, he did all these things. And so, uh, yeah, like six or eight people turned into 60 or 80 people and, and a thousand words turned into over a thousand like single spaced typed um, interview transcripts. Um, and, uh, and a couple weeks turned into uh, like three or four years. And so I, I called this story a eulogy that got out of hand. Uh, and most of the stories I heard just sitting on people's porches and in their cars and their offices, um, talking about our friendship with Rob, uh, most of the stories tended to uh, focus on his generosity and his loyalty and uh, um, his quirks, the way he would crack every knuckle rapid fire, it was kind of gross, or the way he would tutor people's kids on their math homework and pick people up at the airport at any hour. Um, and, and just to the person he was. Um, but some of the stories started to become more painful and troubling that started to nod toward this uh, secrecy he had about, about his relationship with his father and, and the drugs, using drugs, selling drugs, um, his unfulfilled dreams, um, his pain, his need, his uh, fears, uh, a lot of things that even his closest friends were not aware of until it was too late to, to maybe help him somehow. Um, I think, again, the titles a mouthful, but people ask me 
about that word tragic and what it means in the context of this title in this um, in this guy's life. And uh, to me, the tragedy is that you have this guy Rob, who, I mean, I don't want to lionize him too much. He 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 uh, had had good traits and bad traits, but uh, um, he was surrounded by dozens, maybe hundreds of people like me who really would have done anything for him, um, wanted to be there for him and he would not let us, he wouldn't, he wouldn't uh, share that part of himself. Um, and, and that is tragic to me. And in the meantime, a lot of these stories, this might sound familiar about Rob, they ended the same way that Rob was the man, Rob Peace was the man. And uh, um, it was easy to believe that because that's what Rob, projected that uh like that's what he always said like it's all good like i'm good and uh because um he'd overcome so much to go to yale it, it felt like people like me couldn't certainly couldn't give him advice and uh to his friends he grew up with it seemed like because he was so smart that he went to yale they couldn't give him advice and he was in this kind of vacuum of uh of of just having no, I don't know what kind of support you, you really needed, but uh, um, even the simplest kind of support, like sitting with a friend and letting them listen. Um, and that was one of the hardest things I learned um, writing this book. I mean, I learned a lot about his father and, and that uh, secret attachment he had, Rob. I mean, we all know that our relationships with our fathers are, are pretty big stuff. Um, but Rob sort of beginning at age seven, when his dad went to prison, he sort of started acting like he was the man of his own house and he kept hidden how close he remained with his father and, and throughout his life, how, how much of his time and his spirit he spent trying to get his father free from prison. He firmly believed his father was innocent. Um, it, it's not really my place to say one way or the other, but um, I learned a lot about that. Uh, and uh, anyway, so in this context, I just, I learned a lot about this word help and this idea of help and whether you're in high school or college or later on in the workplace um, with your friends, with your family. Um, I, I just learned that there's help available. Um, I mean, in school, there's all kinds of counselors. And um, if you have good friends, they usually want to want to hear what you need and, and try to help. Um, but a lot of help is only there if you ask for it. Um, and what I learned is a guy like Rob, um, I try not to psychoanalyze him too much. But um, I know this to be true because he said it, he saw the very act of asking for help. Again, even the simplest kind of help from a friend as, a, as an expression of weakness and even a source of shame. Um, and again, that, that's what I see as the tragedy. And now, I mean, I, I present this story a lot to uh, college age kids and high school age kids. And I always try to make a point that um, this book is not intended to, um, it's not intended to push the idea that anybody who feels isolated in college or, or um, has inner conflict or loss or inner demons is going to make some of the decisions Rob made and is going to uh, experience the isolation that Rob experienced. Um, but a lot of young people and a lot of people my age, uh, including myself at different times in life, we get pretty good at, at hiding things and particularly hiding our frailties. Um, and so I, through the course of writing this, I, I talked to loads of people who maybe shared more with Rob's, more of Rob's challenges than I personally shared, maybe threads 
with his upbringing, like poverty and, and fractured families and drugs and addiction and um, other forms of loss. And I mean, almost all of those people I spent those hours with are living what we would call successful lives and they have their own families and they own homes and cars and have fulfilling jobs. <clears throat> but almost every one of those people, men, women and men too, uh, cried at some point, like real tears in front of me while we, while we talked about Rob's story, like, um, the, like the tattered strands of, of all those feelings still trailed them out of their childhood and school, you know, over a decade later. Um, so there's that. And, uh, um, and then, you know, as far as writing this book and people ask me a lot sort of why I did that, um, why I wrote this book, um, and, I, you know, I still don't maybe have a totally satisfactory answer for that. Again, it's a eulogy. It got out of hand. I just, I started writing and I, I didn't stop for a few years. Um, and uh, I, I missed him. I still miss him. And I struggle a bit with uh, some of the success that the book had and whether what Rob himself would think about this book. He was a pretty private guy, especially about his dad. Um, so he would probably uh, be pretty pissed off at me. Um, and he wasn't the kind of person you wanted uh, pissed off at you for real. Uh, but I, I think you would see the, the uh, positive impact his story has, particularly on young people and particularly on young men as far as uh, there's something about his story. And, and I've seen this up close many, many times. There's something about Rob and his story that impels young men to share their own stories um, and assume that vulnerability. And uh, I think we all here maybe know how important that is and how hard that is. Um, and I would also maybe conclude by adding that uh, a lot of the story definitely came out of guilt, uh, a lot of different layers of guilt, but particularly the guilt of thinking back to so many dorm room conversations and dining hall conversations and phone conversations after we'd grown up a bit after college, where we would just be talking about, again, not, not much, um, again, because we're guys and that's an unfortunate part of a lot of male friendship, but we just be talking and I look back and I think of so many opportunities where if I had been less distracted with a girl or like a track meet or something in my own family or some petty part of my life and I had just focused totally on Rob and maybe asked another question, <clears throat> asked something about his dad, something hard, something uncomfortable. Um, I'm not, definitely not saying I could have changed the outcome or, or helped him much, but um, I, I would have been a better friend. I would have known him better. Um, and I think if a lot of people had undertaken that discomfort and, uh, and that vulnerability, um, maybe he would still be around, but uh, we generally don't like to be uncomfortable and vulnerable, even in the context of our closest friendships. And, uh, and so all, all that's left there really is this, uh, um, you know, there's no one to blame for his de death really more than Rob himself. Rob was smart enough to know better some of the decisions he was making and he was loving enough to know what it would do to his mom and the people who cared about him if the worst happened. Um, but he did it and the worst did happen. And, uh, and we're kind of all, all these uh, people I've mentioned, we're all left with this grief uh, mostly and um, I mean, I think we're all of an age where we've lost people and 
we know that grief and we know the regret that is embedded in that grief, different kinds of regret. And we know the love that is also a part of that grief. And, uh, and all that's left is to sort through it all and hold on to it tight, I think. Um, be a better friend to the people who are still around. I'm sorry if I'm getting into kumbaya mode here at the end, um, but I, I think that's all right. And uh, I think Rob would think it's all right. Um, and yeah, so I, I did a weird thing and wrote a whole book about the guy, but um, maybe it's also worth just uh, getting in groups like this and talking and reflecting on, on all this. So uh, um, that's me and that's Rob and that's the book. And uh, again, I really appreciate you all listening and uh, um, listening to my ramblings. So uh, I'm really excited to hear from you. Thank you, Thomas. That's awesome, Jeff. I guess what I'd like to say is let's do the uh, sharing and then um, if you wouldn't mind like just reading a, a short passage at the very end. Oh, sure. Okay, so I'm gonna pause, there we go. Fire away. Oh, thanks everyone, That this has been really special um, and, and uh, um, I'm just glad to hear from all of you. This is a this isn't like some a big passage or anything. Just a very short page um, about um, again this theme of male friendship. Um, it's a conversation that happened um, not actually that long before Rob was killed um, between him and our other our third roommate from college who uh, he was also black. Um, grew up in very different circumstances. And um, he also ran, he was on the track team with me and we actually ran the same event. So uh, um, he and I also spent a lot of time together and we, we made a pretty good trio. And I'm actually taking my daughter to visit him in a, in a month. Um, but uh, anyway, this page is just uh, um, sometime after college graduation, he reached out to Rob, just to check in, and, and um, it's a small little passage, but hopefully it speaks to what we've been talking about a little bit. Um, I've always looked up to you, Ty Canty said into the phone. Ty and his wife were living in San Jose for a portion of their residencies. Through an arrangement with the hospital, they were swapping 12-hour shifts so that one of them could always be with their two children. The existence was grueling and made more so by the fact that for months at a time, they saw each other only in passing, just long enough to trade parenting details, such as when medicine was to be administered and how much food should be eaten. Spontaneously one afternoon in March, having slept for four hours in the last 48, Ty thought of Rob and he called him half expecting the cell number to have changed. Rob answered in his deep voice and Ty told him why he'd called, simply to say that Rob had always inspired him. Um, Thanks, I guess, Rob replied, sounding uncomfortable with this naked emotional sharing between men. I'm serious, Ty said. He didn't know why he was so desperate to get his feelings across. I guess I always wish I could be more like you. Uh, Rob still seemed uncomfortable. You're a cool dude too. Ty tried to recall moments that would illustrate his feelings. He had been troubled for a long time by the dissolution of his memory. He had been the top student in the Yale pre-med class of 2002 and very near the top at Harvard Medical School with unsurpassed memorization skills. But a few years of marriage, fatherhood, and residency had nearly wiped his brain clean of what mattered more and more as time passed conversations, the meals, the small moments that happened between friends. Anyway, Ty said, I just wanted to say that to you. I appreciate it, Rob replied. I gotta get back to the kids now. Enjoy them, Rob said, and he seemed to mean it, and they both hung up. Um, So uh, yeah, again, just a small passage. Um, Thank you all. Thank you so much, it was beautiful. All right, big love, namaste, everyone. Well, what what was week. that passage from, Jeff? Jeff, was that another book of yours? Uh, no, that that was the Rob piece.